on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I am so fascinated by the Black Death mm. and like the bubonic plague. And so I actually did write a romance um, that started with the bubonic plague. Wow. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. Yes, it is Friday, which means it's The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Uh, it is a tumultuous Friday. Not Friday, it's Thursday. It's not really Friday. I was lying. Um, but it's Thursday. But a tumultuous day here in the UK. We're going to park that because who knows? A day is a long time in politics where we are. Everything might have changed by next week, so we can't even talk about that. What we can talk about, though, is that we have a couple of exciting things to announce. Uh, first of all, a reminder that tickets for the self-publishing show live, this podcast, but live with fellow authors filling uh, a wonderful space in London South Bank, the artistic home uh, uh, we have here in London in the UK. Uh, tickets are on sale now if you want to join us for two days in June in 2023. And you need to go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live uh, for your early bird offer. Uh, you can get uh, uh, around 20% off the uh, ticket prices and they will go up in the new year uh, if there's any left by then. So looking forward to people joining us in June next year. We are very busy in the background organizing that conference. It takes a long time to organize a conference like that. I should say we are Friday, so we're releasing a blog today, and the blog is on decision making for authors. Wow, should have decision making for politicians. We should do that blog. Um, decision making for authors. I don't know what that's about, but I'm going to read it as I always do. They're excellent blogs. And uh, Mark, we should mention that we have a new course, as you say, self publishing launchpad. I get used to saying that. We've been calling it Self-Publishing 101. It is the 101 course. We've been through revising it, adding some bits to it, and repackaging it. It's a more full course. Everyone who's on 101 will get Launchpad, but it's going to be called Launchpad, and it is going to be open for enrollment. The very, very first SPF Launchpad will be open for enrollment on November 9th of November. Yeah, 9th of November. So if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash launchpad, uh, first of all, you'll be able to join the waitlist for it. But as long as you're on our mailing list, you'll be alerted to when that goes, uh, uh, that opens and your chance to enroll in that. And this is the foundation course. We'll talk about it in more detail in the future, but the foundation course to get you set up to be successful as an author. And it's one that's launched many authors in the past. Hence the word launchpad. Right, Mark, we have an interview today about historical fiction. You've written a bit of historical fiction. I write historical fiction. And Madeleine Martin has had a huge breakout hit with the last bookshop in London uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, but before then, she was writing regular historical romance, I think Regency period. So she was a brilliant person to talk to. We bumped into each other in uh, in Florida for the NIC conference. And I knew that I wanted to get get into the weeds with her about writing historical fiction. But of course, as all these interviews, there's something in it, whatever genre you're writing in, and not least hearing about the success and the journey that ooh, the journey that uh, Madeline Martin has had. So let's hear from Madeline. Then Mark and I will be back for a chat. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Madeline Martin, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. Lovely to speak to you again because. A couple of weeks ago, is it? was it a couple of weeks? It doesn't seem that long ago. We were in the same room. Yeah. I know, we were at Nink. It's so great to see you again too, James. It was so lovely in Nink. Uh, I got chased out by a storm, but you are you live there. How far away from the hurricane were you? We're not too bad. We're on the East Coast, so okay. we were on the opposite coast. Um, but we, we actually got more weather when it was hitting the West Coast than we did when it was um, coming more toward the East Coast. Yeah, those early Just bands. Of the band. Yeah, the bands. Oh, yeah. I learned all about the bands. Yeah, we got uh, we got heavily rained on for a bit. I bet you never thought you'd know so much about hurricanes as you do now. I tell you, my takeaway from it all is that um, 
is that the hurricanes, obviously, their big storms are like 500 miles across. But actually, the, the destructive zone is quite small. It's this yes. the bit in the middle. That's where. And if you're 20 miles away, actually, it makes quite a big difference to where. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting because the eye, once it hits the eye, totally calm. And then it's crazy again. Weird. Like, it's it's just yeah. so crazy. Yeah. Anyway, we've just been talking about Florida life. And you told me you've got two gators in your garden, which is frankly <laughs> terrifying. But anyway, okay. Well, let's, um, <laughs> let's park all that for the moment. Uh, uh, it was a lovely conference. And we could talk about it for a long time. But let's talk about you. And let's talk about historical fiction, because I'm excited to talk about this subject. But Madeline, why oh, don't yeah. you tell us where you got going writing? Um, so I, well, I've always kind of written, my mom sent me these boxes that she'd been moving around the world forever. Um, and when I started going through them, I found all these little chapters that I had written when I was a little girl. Apparently at one point I even had like a hardcover book that I made the hardcover for. And it was like, I illustrated it myself when I was like in fifth grade. <laughs> um, so it's something I think that has always kind of, I've always had stories in my head. I think with a lot of us authors we have, and, um, you know, um, I, I just, after I went on maternity leave with my daughter, I read Outlander and I loved it so much. I loved the history of it. I loved, you know, the big brawny Highlander and, and the feisty Sassanach, you know, and, and I thought, oh, it'd be so great to really just write a book. And so that's when I really kind of got started with it. So many American written books are about the, the English versus the Scottish. It's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. There's a bit of that here, but uh, um, okay. So that started you off and uh, you had... I think you had one big breakout hit quite early on, didn't you? Uh, not early on, actually. No. It was, um, I think it was my 34th book. Was it your, it was, you are was... so prolific, I'd forgotten about that. So your 34th oh, book, but you. how many years on was that? Um, so that was actually um, last year that book came out. And oh, okay. um, yes, that was the last bookshop in London. And that one was actually historical fiction. And that one actually hit number eight on the New York Times bestseller list. Wow, congratulations. That's yeah, so exciting for you. Now, before the last bookshop in London, what was your career looking like? I mean, you were successful. You were earning a living yes. from it. Yes. Um, so I was writing six to eight historical romances a year. Um, I did a medieval uh, and regency and some that were also set um, in the 1700s or eight. I can't remember now off the top of my head. <laughs> That's what happens when you do write so yeah. many of them. <laughs> like a time traveler. Um, yeah, really. And, and you know, I, I just, I love the research aspect of it so much. I know that you can relate to that. And, um, and I think that's why I kind of was just like sort of history jumping so much. Like, oh, let me do medieval. Okay, I've done a bunch of medieval. I want to learn something new. Oh, let me do regency. And, um, and so that's kind of how I was going through with that. But I was working a day job, actually. I was a business analyst. And um, so my running joke was that I was a full-time mom, full-time writer, and full-time business analyst because that's kind of how it felt. Yeah. <laughs> I was like sleeping like four hours a night. Um, but, you know, I was actually, my career was doing pretty well because I was releasing a book like every other month with my, with self-publishing. And, um, and it was, and then I got laid off uh, actually right before the pandemic which nice. was pretty brutal because I, and the writing was on the wall. Everybody was kind of being laid off. So I was thinking it might happen. So my husband and I were talking about it and he said, you know, my books are doing pretty well. Um, I kind of want to write a historical fiction, but it's going to take a lot more time. So if I do get laid off, I think I'm just going to, I'm just going to write full time. And he was like, do it. So I got laid off. And, and after writing for like over a decade, I thought, Oh, I finally get to be home by myself and I can just write. And then a couple of weeks later, the pandemic happened and everybody was home forever. Yes. Yeah. It's <laughs> I so, got robbed. <laughs> so, so good to have a supportive other half, though, because um, 100%. Uh, very important. I mean, he could easily have said, well, Walmart has jobs rather than, right. that, rather than stay at home and, uh, and, and write. And I think that's the lovely thing when, you're, when your partner knows this is something that means a lot to you. And oh, clearly, if you've been making books as a little girl, here you are decades later, not too many decades later. Few decades yeah, later. No, not to me. No, uh, <laughs> with an opportunity, and that's one of the great things about the indie landscape we live in now. This opportunity for, oh, 100%. Us, for us both to become writers is incredible. Absolutely, yes, yeah, and and I mean, um, with uh, you know, I've, I've had times in my life where I've had somebody who wasn't very supportive, and so having my husband's support now because we really met after I was already writing, it, it really is just so absolutely incredible. It's something that I never take for granted. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about historic. I mean, you said one, one of the great things about it is you, you write essentially romances, but you, because you jump around in historical periods, it does feel like a whole different genre, I guess. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, and then like, especially with writing historical fiction, that also is. So, is... so let's, let's divide that up. So you've got historical romance and historical fiction. So in a, in a historical fiction, is it, I mean, cause I'm a thriller writer. So I always think page turning, something's going to happen. W what is the kind of trope that you would describe in your, your historical fiction? I think one of the big things of historical fiction is really thinking about um, the time period almost as its own character, because it does take such a forefront step in the book. Whereas with historical romance and with historical thrillers, I feel like it's more of a backdrop. I mean, it's still, of course, the details are very important, but you're not going to be like, taking a, st a stop and, and detailing out exactly what happened in that time period and, and why it's important more than just kind of moving on and letting it kind of fall back, you know, in the background. Yeah, that's a good description. And what was, which, which period did you write romance and which period did you write fiction in? So um, my romance was medieval and um, the 1700s and Regency era. And my historical fiction is World War II. Ah, oh, yes, of course. And that's the last bookshop in London. Correct, yes. Yes, okay. Well, let's, we'll talk about that in a moment, but let's talk about the historical romance then first. Um, and then one interesting thing I, I think about this, I was chatting to our mutual friend, I think, uh, Cecilia Mecca. Yes, Bella Michaels, so She writes her contemporary romance, <laughs> yes. but Cecilia, and she was laughing about the fact that she writes, um, you know, Scottish medieval romance, but in actual fact, this was a pretty horrible era to, era to live in. You know, people didn't oh, yeah. wash very well. The hygiene wasn't there. Disease was prevalent. Nobody looked great by the time they got to the age of 30. But it's fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. And that's not going to be on the front cover. <laughs> and that actually extends, I think, even further with um, uh, with things like the Regency period. We've had a few of these adaptations uh, uh, going around the globe where there is not just a sanitized version of what life was like, but a... A slightly, I'm going to use the word, and I don't mean it disparagingly at all, but a slightly cheesy version of that era <laughs> to allow it to fit into what we want it to be, which is we a like romance. We like to think of the term as romantic. Romance. Than so cheesy. that's basically <laughs> the, what I'm getting to. But that, and I guess that's what you do here. Or how much do you think? Well, no, I'm going to be more slavishly devoted to the realities of the era. Or are you delivering a romance book? So when it comes to romance, you definitely do take more of a sanitized version of history. Um, and, you know, in, in certain instances, I think, as far as that goes, like, you know, people probably had horrible breath yes. <laughs> for one, but we have them like wake up and kiss, you know, yeah. and, and like really like they would have like no nose hair left. And not, not, um, not you know? passing out. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I read this really great. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of it now. It's basically like this whole introduction to like if you lived in a medieval town and it was such an incredible book. But but the guy was that was talking about it basically said that. You know, most of the peasants, I think, by the age of 30 would have either a limp or an arm that didn't really function fully because of all of the injuries that they sustained at the difficulties of their jobs. And um, and of course, you know, we have these people like we have these gray foxes going on. We've got, you know, a lot. I mean, everybody's pretty healthy. Everybody has great smiles. Nobody has like excessive, you know, hair or bad breath or anything like that. But, you know, you do still have a lot of the realities that come into play. And um you know, you have like the atrocities that are committed during that time period. Um, you have like a lot of the political intrigue. You have a lot of the feudalism that's going on in that society. So you do still have some some aspects of it. I actually, and Cecilia was actually laughing at me when we were at Nink, we were chatting about this, but um, I love, I, this sounds so weird. I am so fascinated by the Black Death mm. and like the bubonic plague. And so I actually did write a romance um, that started with the bubonic plague. <laughs> wow. That's, that's yeah. a challenge. I, I was, I just, I was like, man, I really want to write this plague book. And so, uh, so the heroine is like a witch and everything. And uh, she's being tried as a witch because of the bubonic plague yes. going on and everything. It was, I had it a is. lot of, it was a book for me. <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. Well, I, I think it is a fascinating period. And whenever I sit on the Piccadilly line, which is one of our, our tube trains, our subway trains in London. Yeah. Um, I read this once. And I've never forgotten it. Between two of the stations, actually just south of King's Cross, the train goes on a fairly violent sort of you know you just move around in your seat which everyone ignores but what they're actually doing is going around a plague pit which when they were digging it they realized was there and even though it was centuries old it was this mush of 
potentially still the bacteria there or that was it a virus bacteria i can't remember but oh wow uh, yeah so that's i mean it's a living breathing thing in london and occasionally wow. they, do, they do come across these plague pits they did it recently actually with the um uh, the crossrail link in london that was a bit of a news story but yeah wow, so that's it, so fascinating. But it is fascinating and i think people are yeah. are gripped by it but i don't think that's a bad backdrop for a romance novel actually it sounds I mean, there oh, was I Love in the Time of Cholera, <laughs> wasn't there? there? was a famous book as well, which I haven't read, so I don't really know whether it's a romance or just fiction. But <laughs> anyway, okay, so you've got your kind of Bridgerton esque um, look and feel to like the Regency year in that case, or, or right. medieval period, to allow you to not be distracted by the um, things we would just find unpalatable and unpleasant today. But otherwise, how much research goes into your books? This is before um, the, before I'm, I'm going to separate out the World War Two one. Right, right, yeah. So, um, so really, before I would start writing in a new time period with romance, I would do about a year's worth of research on it just to get a foundational understanding of that time period, what the language was used, um, sort of like the economic and political situation, um, you know, uh, how they dressed, how they acted, like things like that. So, um, so that, and then once I have the foundational then the individual book research isn't as intense because really you just might say, oh, okay, well, this is during this time with King James, for example, what with what specifically was going on in King James's court that could possibly impact, uh, you know, this particular character in this particular situation. This is James the first, obviously, I guess. Um, yes, yes. Sixth of Scotland, first of England. I know because I'm, I'm James, I have a regnal name. Um, <laughs> okay. And a year, I mean, that surprised me, a year's worth of research. And what form did that take? Was this just reading and sitting on the internet? Did you, or did you go to classes or something? Or um, A lot of it is getting nonfiction books and reading a lot of nonfiction books. Um, but, you know, there's, especially nowadays, there's so many different mediums that you really can glean information. So a lot of it is, you know, history channel, YouTube channel, where people go to these sites and they get to explore it and you can kind of watch it from their perspective. Um, it is also taking classes. There are all sorts of wonderful online workshops that really delve into like Celtic history and the medieval times and Regency era. Um, so a lot of it comes to that. And, uh, and also just, you know, just even reading books in that time period by authors who, you know, who, who do their research. So it's almost like you kind of get this almost immersive experience that your brain is just like, you're, you're hearing the music, you're eating the food, you know, you're reading the books, you're reading the nonfiction, and you're just immersing yourself completely in this experience and, and really getting your head in that world. And do you find it, did you find it hard to market? I'm never really sure how, how big the historical romance market is. I know Cecilia works very hard at it, but she has actually started contemporary romance as well, because I think she feels that might be an easier, bigger audience. Did you find that as well? It's quite hard to find your audience. Well, um, I don't have the contemporary to compare it to, but I will definitely say it is a little bit difficult to find ways to market it, even just to get ad copy, like to just make ads. There's really not a lot of um, historical images out there that are readily available um, that not everybody else is using yeah. <laughs> because there really is just such a limited stock. And because so many historical romance authors are so very prolific. Everybody's just devouring all of those, um, all those pictures that are out there. And I mean, I don't know that I'm ever going to get to the point where I can justify paying $5,000 to have an ad that nobody else can have just because I want that picture. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, so I you're, think that makes you, it a little bit different. Are you and Cecilia going to get together and hire some men in kilts at some point and I mean, we wouldn't be opposed to no. it. And then if <laughs> in you... fact, we would actually take volunteers. <laughs> yes. But you, you've got to remember to take some pictures for your books as well. It's, um, oh, definitely. Absolutely. Spend the afternoon <laughs> larking with them. Yes. Yeah, so no, I can see that is an issue. I mean, in my world, even in, in his 1960s military, there's it's very difficult. In fact, in the end, we did. Uh, I dressed up. I bought the stuff off eBay and I dressed up to get, uh, I mean, it was, it was, we had to do it to get a, a figure on the front wearing the right uniform. I think because, that's awesome. Yeah. And what a story. <laughs> what a story, yeah. So that was my first cover, actually. I have replaced it subsequently, but that's me standing in the back, running, walking away from camera. But, I didn't realize that. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and it, the difficulty is, and you'll have the same thing, is that historical readers are usually knowledgeable and they will notice something that's that's out of period. And it was my father who looked at the standard stock image we had of a 19, you know, a, a vintage, what, a 1960s 
pilot my dad said straight away that's a world war ii may west he's wearing <clears throat> and um so yeah we had to do that and it turned out the government in the uk have all the pictures and they won't release them for commercial oh. use so that's really difficult so yeah, yeah no i have the same the same issue and um i can see in romance where you have it's a particular type of image that you want that, that you you're going to see those repeated around the place is that that absolutely that extends to covers as well um it, it can extend you know usually so it's really interesting with um indie covers these the people who do covers are amazing because they can take somebody's um, body, like the position of their body. They can swap out their head, which I think it just it, it reminds me of like I had a friend when I was a kid who used to do that with her Barbies. Like she would have like the really tall one and she like take her head off and put a brunette's head on instead because she wanted her to wear that outfit, whatever. Um, <laughs> so it's like you swap out their heads. They can completely design a new dress. Um, which is, again, kind of going back to playing like, you know, dress up with with the characters, put a whole new background. So you could potentially have somebody who's sort of lounging on a chaise or something along those lines. And and she could be so many different people because you can also add a man who is kind of crawling toward her. And hey, you could swap his head out too, <laughs> give him a different shirt. I mean, it is amazing I mean, I'm like a stick figure kind of drawer. So for me, like artists, I, I am yeah. <laughs> horrible at that kind of thing. It blows my mind the amount of creativity and, and beautiful images that cover designers are able to come up with. Yeah. So basically they can use, they can repurpose the same image multiple times and no one would notice, certainly at a casual glance would notice. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So you've got your your three uh, historical romance series and where were you with them? And you sort of left left each period behind when you finished it or are you going to add to those series? Um, all of my series are done right now with the exception of um, a Regency series that I started recently called Wedding, uh, Wedding a Wallflower. It's the Wedding a Wallflower series. Sounds good. And that's what you're writing at the moment, is it? Um, actually, I'm writing a World War II historical fiction at the moment. Okay, so let's move on to World War II. <laughs> so this is quite different uh, for you. First of all, it's not romance. And Correct. second of all, World War II, for me, I write 20th century historical romance. So a his I don't write historical romance, 20th century historical <laughs> thriller. But it seems to me quite fundamentally different from medieval and earlier periods um, oh, absolutely. And that's a big jump for because it's much more relatable to the way that we live and breathe today. Right. You know, it's it's really interesting even just with doing my research and realizing a lot of the modern things that we have today that they had back then. Like they had escalators. Who mm. knew, right? And and they even had roller coasters. I mean, it's just, it blows my mind every time I find something new where I'm like, oh my gosh, they had that back then too. It, it really is just incredible to me. Yeah, and they were driving to the shops and their lives ostensibly were sort of the same, whereas you couldn't say that about yeah. somebody in 1500 or even 1700s. So, right. so this was something, I get the feeling this was like a labour of love, not a labour of love, a labour as such, but this was a project that you wanted to do and you were less concerned about perhaps the commercial side of it. You just wanted to write this book. Is that right? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, um, you know, I grew up in Germany and it's really interesting having grown up in Germany um, just because of World War II and getting to go to the museums and um, like having speeches that were given to our school. It really put things in such a fascinating perspective for me just because, um, you know, they want to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. And I think that that really left an indelible mark on me as I grew up. And so World War II has been something that I've always been very fascinated by as a result. And so really getting to delve into a lot of this research and write these books about World War II, um, it really, it, it's like it's unveiling each individual aspect because I've, I've done, I'm, I've done like a different country for each book. And so it's almost showing me different cogs in the whole World War II aspect. And um, I mean, it's just, I feel so honored to be able to share a lot of these stories that I feel like have kind of been buried in history to demonstrate how brave people have been in, in the past. Yeah, it was an extraordinary period. And you've set it in London, I think. But so just sorry, briefly, tell me about your, your journey. Was that you were, uh, was your father and the, father and mother in the services or? Yes, my dad was in the army. Okay. So we were there for three different tours. So we were in um, Frankfurt, um, Darmstadt, I'm sorry, Darmstadt, which was by Frankfurt, Würzburg, the next tour, and then Bad Kreuznach for the third one. Yes. Okay. Um, I was also a service uh, service child, but uh, stayed, oh, in, stayed in the UK. Um 
Okay, so uh, and of course, even in within Europe, the, in Germany, World War Two is is talked about in a different way for very obvious reasons, and it is in in the UK. You must have noticed that as well. And I guess you were exposed to that sort of sensibility on the German side that we don't get exposed to so much. Right. I mean, there definitely was a lot of um, just like like the horrors of what happened and like the shame of it. And like, we don't ever want this to happen again. And, um, you know, you know, in Europe also, they like don't really filter things as much. And so seeing a lot of like the horrors and the atrocities and everything, it just, it really just struck me very, very deeply as a child. And so, um, so yes, I, I think that's really what kind of got me on the path of like wanting to learn more about World War II and, and how the other countries reacted and everything. So the book, where what was the story in the gist and where did that come from? So with the last bookshop in London, um, that particular one was inspired by a bombing of Paternoster Row at the end of December in 1940. It was during the Blitz and Paternoster Row was where the publishing industry really was. And so during that particular bombing, over 5 million books were destroyed and there was a paper ration on at the time. So these books really couldn't just be reprinted. And so it was something where it just kind of made me think like, you know, what if there was this bookstore and it really was almost like a community that really brought people together um, with all of these horrible things going on. And they sort of found solace, not only with one another as readers, but also in books themselves. And that's where the idea for The Last Bookshop in London came from. Okay. So I know Paternoster Square near St. Paul's Cathedral. Is that the same area or is that? Yes. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. In fact, St. Paul's Cathedral, they were so worried about that um, burning. They actually had people who were there who volunteered to throw sticks of incendiaries off and and had buckets of water they'd run up with and everything. And there's this beautiful picture where the smoke is kind of clearing from the Blitz and um, and St. Paul's Cathedral is there. Yeah, completely intact still that's a very famous photograph we see it a lot uh, in the uk oh, i'm so, sure sort yeah. of sums up the blitz of that that period yes yeah, it is amazing when you look back that st paul's got got through virtually unscathed. oh absolutely yeah 100 percent. yeah um oh well, that sounds like a great uh story and uh funny enough Thank those you. those little bookstalls still exist in london to know in fact if you come to the self-publishing show live in um in june in london there's there's a very, very famous bookstall just down the road on the South Bank there, which has been going for many years, maybe even back to the Second World War, still there today. Uh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, they set it up every morning. So you have your, your situation, and then you obviously have to have a story. Now, I'm interested in this because despite the fact I read fiction, not so much anymore. I think I read mainly genre fiction now because I'm writing it. But up until writing, I used to read just literary fiction. I used to read Ian McEwan and people like that. Yeah. Um, and it... It fascinates me now as to how stories work when it's just fiction and you don't have those expected beats that you've got to hit in in romance and and thriller and so on. So how did you set about adjusting to that? Um, Well, you know, I think the biggest thing for me is that I really um, I explored a lot of the other character development with the other characters, like the supporting characters because I've written romance for so long, I was used to having a hero and a heroine, their arcs that sort of, you know, go together. And, um, and the back, the black moment really is entangled with both of them. And at the end, they both help each other grow. So for me, I think one of the biggest differences was really being able to explore those outside characters. So I could develop friendships and, um, you know, like almost like pseudo parents and, and things like that. And that really did help as far as moving the plot along as well because you you wanted to have all of these different relationships that were developing as the story went on and especially with the blitz the people because i start before the blitz and i end after the blitz is over so i mean even if you just take us into consideration before the pandemic and after the pandemic i feel like the people that we are now are still different than the people we were before we started the pandemic and that was really integral not only to character creation and development but also the plot as well. Yeah. So of course there is plot, but the character development is more more of a substantial part of the read, I guess. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And as far as the plot goes, I mean, I I mean, I hate to say it's almost kind of written for you, but like history, man, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so you know, I did extensive research. I knew all of the bombs. Um, in fact, all of the bombs that are detailed in the last bookshop in London are real, with one exception. Right. Um, yay, fiction. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I mean, so, you know, I really did use actual real life events that were happening 
to form my plot. And it was based off of how my character was reacting to those and, and what sort of um, path that might have set her on. And did you discover much about attitudes to the Germans at that time? Sort of in the in the war films that we grew up on, in, that were made mainly in the sixties, fifties, and sixties, they hated Hitler as a demon. I mean, quite, oh, absolutely, quite yeah. rightly demonized guy. But there, yes. was no, there was no subtlety to that. I mean, it was just a kind of this guy's trying to kill us. Oh, and, well, and it wasn't even just so. It was not only hate, but there was also um, a need to want to understand him. A little bit more. So, for example, there is because I researched books that came out during that time period, and there was one book that was published by Penguin, and it was called, I think, "What Hitler Wants." And, um, and I thought I found that really interesting because apparently, like, um, people really did want to understand. I mean, because even if you think about here um, and, and nowadays, like in the contemporary world, if somebody if there's a school shooting, everybody says, "Why did he do it?" They have there's like this fundamental, you know, human desire to know why something happens. So I think it's actually really interesting that somebody wrote a book as to what Hitler wants. And, and people are wondering, what does he want? Why is he doing this? So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, but generally, definitely. I mean, of course, I mean, the, the people also were, you know, obviously very angry and derogatory toward the Nazis as well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> because yes. they're being bombed and these horrible things are happening. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I have heard a couple of quite dark stories about um, pilots who were downed and didn't survive back to, you know, when they came down in a field, they survived the crash, but they didn't survive being rescued uh, by yeah. local farmers. And that's and that sort of gives you... Uh, oh, you uh, mean the, the German ones? The, ger yes. the Germans, yes. the Germans yes. survived their crash landing, but they didn't survive being rescued in inverted oh, yeah. commas by <laughs> local people with pitchforks. Absolutely. So, <laughs> they were um, more than happy to take their aggressions yeah. out. Yes. <laughs> and so that just is <laughs> an insight into how bitter people felt. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it was um, like so one kind of interesting tidbit that I learned when I was writing The Last Bookshop in London was um, how people how the countries were actually also using propaganda against one another. So, for example, um, it, with the RAF, um, the Royal Air Force, they had radar technology. So they were able to pinpoint when the planes were coming in for the blitz. Well, the Germans didn't know about the radar technology. So they started spreading like in Britain, they started spreading a rumor that carrots they were feeding all their pilots all these carrots so they could see in the dark. And so with the blackout going on, they encouraged everybody to eat a lot of carrots. And apparently, rumor has it that um, in Germany, the pilots were being fed carrots as well in the hopes that they too could see in the dark. <laughs> so, you know, using that propaganda campaign. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's right as well, because I remember as a kid being told carrots help you see in the dark. It was only later it became that story that you're telling now has actually only really been understood in the last 20 or 30 years that it was propaganda. <laughs> uh, it was to, to try and to distract from the... Um, from the, the we, radar technology. The radar, yeah. I mean, the Germans, <laughs> Germans are... It's actually funny enough, I'm investigating this area at the moment for my next book. And there was a radar station at Ventnor in the Isle of Wight. I'm thinking about... It became a nuclear bunker in the 60s. I'm thinking about doing something on that. And, oh, cool. and funny enough, I phoned my dad, who was an Air Force pilot, and he immediately said, well, I've got a little vent in the store. And he told me this. He was briefly in charge of it. He never went there, but he put some people in some housing there in the 60s, and it didn't go well. But anyway, that's, <laughs> a, that's an aside. But what I seem to have found out is the Germans were told about, or they knew that somehow they had people over here, they knew about the radar technology. They just never believed it worked. It, oh, they, they I didn't realize that. They, they were absolutely certain it was a bit of a, a front, so they didn't take it seriously, and um, that was very much to their loss. Yeah, oh, uh, absolutely. Thank God. <laughs> yes, yeah, the Battle of Britain so so crucial. Well, this is a, right up my street, I have to say, uh, World War II <laughs> fiction. And did you enjoy it more than writing genre romance? Um, you know what I really enjoyed about it was getting to explore all the other character relationships rather than just being relegated to the hero and the heroine, just because... You know, you had these the friendships that they explored and um, with my particular heroine, um, her mother passed away and her father, she had never really known because he had died when, before she was born. And um, and so, you know, she sort of had this like pseudo mother who was her mother's best friend that I got to explore that relationship, the relationship with the owner of the bookstore who almost became like a father to her and really getting to delve into a lot of the emotion and the depth of those relationships was was really enjoyable. Yeah. Sounds great. And uh, you wrote Thank this you. intending it to be uh, independently published initially? 
Um, actually, no, this one, um, I was actually contracted with this one. Um, so I put together the proposal and it was contracted. And that was with an APUB, an Amazon publisher? Um, oh, nope, this oh. was with Hanover Square Press, who oh, is okay, under sorry. Harlequin. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, Harlequin, yes. Okay. All right. So how, how did that come about? Because you were indie publishing, weren't you? Your series? Correct. Yeah. Well, I was indie publishing, but I also was writing um, Harlequin historical romance as well. So I was with Harlequin. Right. So, um, so that was sort of how that uh, introduction. And tell us how the last bookshop in London was received and how it did. Um, people have loved this book. Obviously, I've, I've, you know, written a lot of books and none of them had e even close to that success, but it was on the USA Today bestseller list, I think, for five weeks. Wow. And, um, and I mean, it's just, it's being translated, I think, into 26 different languages. It's just absolutely incredible. And the really cool thing is people tag me from all over the world on Instagram with all these different international translations and all these different languages telling me that they love this book. And I've, I mean, it's just, it's, it's been such a dream come true for so many people to love this story that, that like really was like out of my head, <laughs> out of my head and also yes. out of history. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, congratulations Thank on you. that. So two questions about that. First of all, the you know, traditional contract versus indie publishing, when books sell well, the contract tends to give you a lower, obviously in most cases, a much lower royalty. So how did that work out for you? Is it still because of the, I guess the volume of sales still a lucrative deal for you. Yes, the volume of sales is just far greater than I ever could have done. I think as an independent, now I will also say I'm no hustler when it comes to indie pubs. Like I know there are so many people out there who have all these amazing ideas and and they do all of these incredible things. And I'm kind of like, and then I wrote this book. Would you like to read it? <laughs> so I will say that the help with with really getting my book out there from a traditional perspective has been very welcome. Um, so so that definitely is a big part of it. And also just even dealing with, uh, I wouldn't know the first thing about internationally selling my books. I, I am with an agent and she probably could do that if I, well, I know she could do that if I needed her to. But um, but as far as, in, you know, with indie books, obviously like you do make significantly more money because you don't have to worry about a royalty rate, but it is the difficulty of getting it out there and, and uh Finding those ad copies that are unique and original. Yes, and all that, all that shenanigans. <laughs> to get the beautiful pictures out there. So you've enjoyed yes. sitting back and just being the author here, and uh, and as you say, traditional publishing. One thing it can do is it can deliver your print version of the book around bookstores uh, in the world, which is very is much more difficult for us to do at any kind of profitable rate. Correct. Yes, because I mean, um, my my other book too that was just recently published, The Librarian Spy, was um, and so was the last bookshop in London, like at Costco, at Sam's, and airports, at Target. I mean, it really was all over. When you get into Target, that's it. I think that's the. Um, I that's know. The key I was so. Oh my. So here's here's kind of a funny story about Target, really quick. So um, I would always go. I'm a huge uh, Target. I love Target. I love and so Target. I would, yeah, you know, always in there. And whenever you walk past that book section, there's only so many books. Like it's a really finite selection of books. And I would always tell myself, someday I'm going to be in Target. And so when the last bookshop in London came out, um, I said, is it going to be in Target? And they said, yes, but it's going to be out like a little bit later. They're releasing it for some, um, for there's a certain reason why. And I said, okay. So every day I would go there, not every day, but every time I'd go to Target, I'd stop by and I checked. And finally, 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 it was at Target. And it was in the very, very back, like at the bottom section where nobody could see it. And I was like happy, but also kind of like, oh man. So then the last bookshop in London did so well and um, the librarian spy came out and it was in Target on release day and I went to Target and it was in the best selling fiction section. Wow. And I kind of started crying a yes, little. Yes, <laughs> of course you did. Because <laughs> it really felt like this, this, you know, the full realization of this dream come true of like, I am going to be in Target. <laughs> oh, that's so fantastic. I, I mean, I can't imagine what that moment looks like. Uh, <laughs> And so, and so the second book is, sorry, the, it, the Librarian, tell me the title again, the second book? The Librarian Spy. The Librarian Spy. And that Correct. is not set in England. No, it is set, it opens in America um, and it takes place, half of it is in Lisbon, Portugal, which was neutral during World War II. And the other half is in Lyon, France, which was the French resistance capital during World War II. Um, and I love research, but wow, I really took a big chunk off with having to research essentially three countries during World War II. Yes, 
Yeah. <laughs> and did you did you do much with the resistance? Was that a big part of the book? It was for the for the French half because she actually works with the printing press. She was inspired by a real woman who existed, and I was um, I was very lucky. I got to go to Portugal and France for my research, and um, also the Library of Congress, where the American aspect was set. Um, but it was amazing when I went to Lyon. When I was at the French Resistance Museum, they had the actual printing press, the Minerva, that the woman who inspired my character used during World War II. Wow. It was absolutely wow. incredible. That is incredible. I think I've been to that museum as well. It's very good. Oh, uh, it is so yeah. good. Um, I was there so long the security guards started following oh, really? me around. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that whole area is is something that potentially I might look at at some point in the future, particularly the the female uh, special operations executive agents oh, who yeah. were sent out from the UK who were invariably murdered and really nasty things happened to them. Yes. But they were the bravest people. And they were incredible. And then, of course, the war finished and women were told to go back into the homes for the next 40 years until eventually they could come back out and fly jets and stuff again but it's um yeah it, was... it really was very sad because they had so much purpose and everything during world war ii a lot of women did and and just afterwards okay we're done with you go back home yeah. and clean your house same with our, our dear queen who was in you know in uniform driving trucks in the yeah Second world war she and then, was amazing yeah. i was actually telling yeah. my kids about that the other day i was yeah. like you know the queen was actually a mechanic during world war ii they're like what yeah <laughs> showed him a picture and everything yeah. <laughs> Um, so, well, this is, it's been a really fascinating conversation. And I think particularly for those of us who write historical romance have heard some of the pain points that we go through with this. And um, I've kept myself relatively in my comfort zone of, of writing in an area that I I just know a lot about because I've been fascinated with it for most of my adult life, which yeah. does make it easier. So I know where to look. <laughs> I know which stones to pick up to look underneath. And a lot of stuff I know even without uh, having to check it. But if I move into the Second World War, which I have thought about doing, um, I'm going to be going down your route, which is I hope. It's... Oh, please call me if you yeah. need anything at all. Email, whatever. Like I, I can point you down some wonderful rabbit holes and help you with anything you need. Who doesn't love going down a, a World War Two rabbit hole? Yeah. Oh, I know, Maybe right? Yeah. There's so many of them. <laughs> I know more about Ventnor radar station than I did uh, a couple of years ago. And that's for sure. Um so where are you now? You said you're you're still working on the World War II series. So that'll be book three, will it? Correct, yes. So this one is called The Keeper of Hidden Books, and it is set in Warsaw, Poland. And um, it's about um, really like, I mean, the Nazis went through and were trying to completely, they actually wanted to um, to completely get rid of Poland. They yeah. wanted to make it into like a second Germany, and they wanted to kill off most of the Poles and keep the few that were left to be slave labor, basically. So they were trying to eradicate all culture in Poland. And there was this huge underground organization trying to ensure that that Polish culture was still able to, to really live. Yeah. So that's, that's what this book is about. That's an incredible uh, era, uh, what happened over there. Was it the Katyn oh, yeah. massacre was the, uh, the beginning oh, oh, gosh, of the... Yeah. Um, although I think the Soviet Politburo had uh, a lot to do with that as well. But anyway, I think they, right. or the Germans blamed the, the Soviets. I can't remember which, which way around it was now. Yeah, I think the Germans must have blamed the Soviets for it. Would it either way. Yeah, and the Soviets, but the Soviets, I mean, that, that was the really, so really, just really quick, I love history. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Poland really it had, hadn't been free for like 123 years until after World War I. After the Treaty of Versailles, it was given its independence and it had just celebrated 20 years of freedom as an independent country when um, Hitler attacked. And, and then it didn't get to be free again until after 1980. Yeah, um, which is just incredible. Absolutely. I mean, I, I had no, I am Polish. My, my right. dad is, my dad's side is Polish. And so getting to explore this aspect of my heritage was really just such a incredible um, and, and really interesting opportunity for me. So, um, but yeah, I got to go to Poland. My mom and I went to Warsaw for two weeks and, and just did so much research and she was a total trooper. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Well, look, Madeline, it's been fascinating talking to you. I've loved it. I hope people have enjoyed listening to us anorak a little bit about um, uh, these particular forays into the past. But for you, I'm so impressed with everything you've done. And uh, I'm Thank so you. pleased you've had this big breakout here, which is uh, such an experience for you. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward. I'm going to have to pick it up at some I have a long TBR, has to be said at the moment. And I'm trying to read <laughs> right? in genre. Don't we all? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me i've i've lifted us lift, oh my goodness i've listened to spf for ages and it's so wonderful to get to actually just be on the show and chat with I, you and 
you're always fabulous. I always love seeing you. Ah, it's so. lovely. <laughs> it's lovely to meet you in Link, and um, and uh, we will see each other again. This sounds good. <laughs> this is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go, Mark. So you did uh, your Soho Noir book. Was it more mm. than one book? Just one. Uh, book. Three. There's three. Three. Was yeah. more than one. Yeah. So that was the first. The first one published ten years ago in November. So um, yeah, the Black Mile set in, in Soho during the forties. Then the Imposter set in the forties and fifties, and Gaslight, which is set uh, before the war um, in the like forty, well, thirty-eight, thirty-seven, thirty-eight. And of course, you and I were working in Soho at the time. So I think, and it is quite mm. an inspiring historical place so it actually hasn't changed very much you walk down past the mm-hmm. Tukun and through Carlisle Street and all those, those buildings they look pretty much the same private eye has been in there for yonks probably um almost back to the 60s I'd imagine so you can almost reach mm-hmm. out and touch some some what's now history and that inspired you was that did that make it easier for you to do your research being in that area was that why you yeah, did it, made it- um, no, I didn't do it for that. I mean, I did it because I had a very interesting story that I wanted to tell there. Well, it was based on a true story. So what I was able to do was, it was based on a, a serial killer that was um, operative during the Blitz in London. So I was able to go, I, could, I knew where the, the houses where the, the victims were found. So I was able to go to the houses, um, which is kind of weird. You're looking up at a house and you yeah. think it's an office now and no one in the office knows that, something very horrible happened there um 70 years ago they have no idea well, Mind many you, would. How, how many london houses that are a couple of hundred years old probably have had something horrible happen in them at some point oh uh, well maybe yeah so it's it was that was quite interesting it, so it was yeah it was i don't know if it made it easier it probably actually made it longer because i was there was a lot more that i could do and because i quite enjoyed the researching um i did lots of it probably more than i well definitely more than i had to do um you didn't have to go into all those opium dens did you but you you still did I did, yeah, and still to this day, to, in, in, still have. I actually got one downstairs, um, a, a little, uh, that, little um, opium den. Sure, I did read the Black Mile, and I think that opium den scene is quite. I could still remember it. You wrote that quite vividly. You mm-hmm. got mm, quite an imagination. Um, I don't know. Have you seen <laughs> the Last Night in Soho? Is it Last Night in Soho? The Edgar Wright film? About the no, color? I haven't. I know it's supposed to be quite good. Yeah, yeah it's really good. It. I thought I'd just think of you actually watching that very Soho noir. Um, good. Okay. Well, I love writing historical fiction, and I have um, gives me excuses if you're watching on YouTube to have things uh-huh. like the Venom Mark yes. Four Pilot's Notes from uh, 1955 with me at any one time. I was referring to those yesterday. In fact, writing a scene, and we'll have more information about our foundation course for self publishing authors which is called self-publishing launchpad a very very comprehensive uh, course to get your career going we'll have more about that next week that's it thank you very much mark thank you to the team in the background and thank you to madeline martin our wonderful guest today and what congratulations we can give her for the success she's had with the last bookshop in london and all that remains for me to say is this a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me and hello Boris Johnson goodbye (laughs) goodbye get show notes the podcast archive and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.